Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the New York Community Works Seminar, including the one joining us online. Uh, we are very, very honored to have Don Chow to um, teach us about the categorifying the Jacobi Trudy identity via the KR um, algebra. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Thank you all for coming to, to listen to the talk. Um, so I guess first, uh, I'm, I'm going to begin with stating some uh, philosophy and kind of saying something roughly about what the word categorify means here. And then later we'll say what the Jacobi Trudy identity is and, and go from there. So first of all, I guess the um, the idea, the overarching idea is that whenever you have some type of an alternating sum, so alternating sum, so there's some sign here, negative one to the, you know, law, like some, some sort of a sign here, times some numbers, maybe positive integers, is equal to some other positive integer, one thing that comes up a lot in combinatorics, I guess, is um, is you take this alternating sum formula and you try to interpret it somehow combinatorially. Like, can you interpret this as some type of a principle of inclusion exclusion sort of thing? So, so let me just say, like a PIE interpretation. So, kind of in terms of like a abstract picture, kind of just conveying this idea, you might, you might do something like, I have a set. So maybe I want to only care about some particular set here. So I cut out some subset here. But then maybe there's some overlap. So I have to I cut this out twice. So I have to put this back in. So this type of thing, this type of a PIE picture. And then so um, I come from uh, uh, like representation theory or algebra. So my philosophy for this talk and the slogan is that uh, whenever I have an alternating sum, so I'm gonna write just the short alting sum, an alternating sum, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to basically kind of think of it as a PIE sort of interpretation, but except um, with vector spaces or representations rather than sets. So I'll start trying to say, okay, so can I turn this into some type of a relationship? Relationship between vector spaces or representations, which I'll just write as reps. Okay, so what's an example of this? So if I just take, uh, again, this is very vague and like uh, not concrete, but I just mean like I take, you know, kind of this picture and I try to replicate it with in terms of like vector space. So maybe instead, let me just begin with, you know, this blob denoting some vector space, which I'm gonna call delta one, some vector space. And um, maybe inside of this vector space or inside of this representation, so maybe this vector space has the structure of a representation of maybe a group or an algebra or something like this. Maybe there's a sub-representation, delta two, and some other representation, delta three. So then I can embed delta two into, into delta one and delta three into delta one. So I can take delta two, direct sum, delta three, and this, and the map is just, I, I embed delta three into delta one and I embed delta two into delta one. But now I've done some overkill. So there's some smaller space here, maybe I'll call it delta four, which gets killed twice. So I have to put that back in kind of. I realize I planned the space kind of poorly. So maybe I have to put a delta four back in. So something like this. And then this is gonna go to maybe the, the set that I'm interested in here, or the space that I'm interested in here called L maybe. So this is an example of what's called a resolution, which just means it's a sequence of maps of you know, vector spaces or representations, or whatever structure you have. And the idea is that the, at every step, so maybe I look at this, the kernel of the map here is equal to the image of the map here. Right, so that's the resolution. Okay, so that's kind of the, the overarching slogan. It's like, I have an alternating sum, I'm gonna try to upgrade it to a relationship between representations. So. Now then, that out of the way, let's talk about the first main character, which is symmetric polynomials. Uh, in the future, I might just write sim poly for short. So what this means is, so what this means is, um, so F is a symmetric polynomial, symmetric polynomial, if permuting any two variables, 
any two variables fixes f. By the way, if I'm writing too small, please let me know, especially on the Zoom, because I guess the, the internet might be, yeah. So that's what a symmetric polynomial is. So what are some examples of symmetric polynomials? So the first example I'm going to talk about is a complete homogeneous. Homogeneous, homogeneous, maybe. Homogeneous um, symmetric function. These are labeled by H's, I guess H for homogeneous. So what does that mean? So H I is equal to the sum, the definition is the sum of all monomials of degree I. So here I've been a little bit sloppy about what I'm saying. So monomials of degree I, I just mean monomials in the set of variables you're using. So you have to say symmetric polynomials and how many variables. So throughout this talk, I'll be a little bit sloppy about how many variables I'm using. Uh, just maybe think like enough variables. So in the examples I'm doing, I'm going to a lot of times just say two variables. So however many variables you have, this is just a sum of all the monomials in those variables of degree i. And, uh, and to define uh, and the next thing, I'm going to have to introduce a little bit of language about partitions. So, so lambda is a partition. So lambda, throughout this talk, lambda is going to denote this sort of a thing, symbols like lambda, is going to be a sequence of numbers, lambda 1, all the way to maybe lambda k. So there's k entries in this in this sequence. Um, I'm gonna so I'm gonna order them. Lambda one is bigger than or equal to lambda two, etc. So I'm ordering them like in a non-increasing way, or maybe let's say yeah, non-increasing way. So this is a partition of n. If the sum of these entries, so yeah, add them all up and you get n. So one common way to represent this is in terms of what's called a Young diagram. And uh, to tell you what a Young diagram is, I think it's best for me to just give an example. So as an example, if I take lambda equals say three, three, one, so three comma three comma one. So that's a non increasing sequence of numbers, which adds up to seven. So I can interpret this as a picture by just saying, okay, let me look at the first entry that's three. So let me write down a row of three boxes, it's kind of three boxes. And then the next three, I'm gonna write down another row of three boxes. And then the next entry is one, so I'm gonna write down a row of one box. So it's clear to see how you go backwards. So given you, if you given a shape like this, um, you can imagine maybe gravity's going upwards and this is like a legit stack, maybe like a stalactite or something. And then you're gonna recover a sequence of numbers. Okay. Then let me define, so given a lambda, H lambda, is defined to be just the product of each of these things. So h lambda one, all the way up to h lambda k. So I just multiply them all together. Yeah. Uh, so as an example, so as an example, if lambda is equal to, so this shape, which you know you can think of as two comma two, since there's two boxes in the first row, two boxes in the second row, um, h times this is equal to, um, is equal to h2 times h2, right? And h2, let's just say we're working in two variables. So it's going to be all the monomials of degree two, so x squared plus xy plus y squared. And then I multiply it twice, so squared. So that's what h of this thing is. OK. So that's one family of complete homogeneous uh, poly uh, Sorry, one family of symmetric polynomials, which is called the complete homogeneous polynomials. So the study of uh, the study of I guess symmetric poly polynomials has a lot of combinatorics, works, very rich combinatorics works attached to it. A lot of this we won't have time to go into uh, detail, any detail today. Another family I want to introduce is this power sum. It's very briefly the power sum family. This is denoted P for power. So P I is defined to be you just sum over. All the variables, so x, sum over x, so however many, this just means however many variables you have, and if you put these variables and I raise it to the i power. So this is called the i power sum. And then again, if I give you, this is a common story, I want to label these families by a partition. So p, if I give you a partition lambda, p lambda just means, same thing as before, p lambda one times all the way to p lambda k. Okay. 
So that's the power of some family. And the one last family I want to introduce is what's called the Schur family, the Schur polynomials. And this is kind of the main character. Uh, so let's play on words. Uh, the main character for today's talk. This is usually labeled S lambda, lowercase s for sure, I guess. Uh, so this has many different constructions. Uh, and in textbooks on, on symmetric polynomials, you'll have to end up proving that they're the same. So today here, the first definition I'm going to give, so I'm going to definition one. So S lambda is equal to some determinant. So this is so this is what I mean by the Jacobi Trudy identity. This is kind of the the where the spotlight is today. S lambda is equal to the determinant of some matrix. What is this matrix? The ij entry is equal to h lambda i plus j minus i. Sorry? Minus one, right? Not minus i. Oh, oh I think okay. minus i. Yeah, minus i. Yeah, minus i. Yeah. yeah. So let me just put this in brackets, right? So that's the Jacobi Trudy identity. Usually, this is something we have to prove. For now, I'm going to take it as one possible definition. So let me just quickly give you an example of what this looks like. Uh, right, so example, if I have lambda is this partition, so four comma two comma one, if you'd like, you can draw this as a Young diagram. So you can draw like that if you prefer. Uh, so the way you would write down this matrix is, I would, right, it's going to be a three by three matrix because there are three entries in my lambda. I'm going to start at the top left. I'm going to write down H sub the first entry, so H4. And then I'm going to be on the second diagonal element. I'm going to write down H sub two, and then, sorry, H sub two, and then the last diagonal element, I'm going to write down H sub one. So that's the diagonal of the matrix. And then as I go right in the matrix, I'm going to increase my index by one. And as I go left in the matrix, I'm going to decrease my index by one. So H4 goes to H5, next one's H6, the next one's H3, this one's H1, and then one less than one is H0, and then next one is H minus one. So by convention, when I have a negative number here, this is defined to be zero, zero, and H0 is equal to one, because there's only one monomial to be zero. Okay. So that's an example. I mean, I'm not going to compute the, the determinant because that wouldn't teach us anything new, but this is this tells you the oh, roughly what it looks like. Okay, so let me see this. Okay. So S lambda, you know, like a determinant, you can expand it out and just like you know, expansion by minors or whatever way you prefer. You can write it as an alternating sum. Sum over, let's say, you know, over the ways to permute the rows and columns. So let me write sum over W. So W is a permutation. It's going to be uh, the sign of some, or so the sign of this permutation, which is combinatorially defined, times uh, times some product of the H's, right? So each, uh, when I do the computation, each term of this will be a product of some of these H's. So I'll just write this as product of H's. So this is an alternating sum. So this kind of fits the slogan or the philosophy that I stated at the beginning, which is that when I have an alternating sum, I want to turn it, I want to upgrade it into some statement about um, vector spaces or representations. So what representations are these? So 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 can we lift can we lift this? And that brings me to part two. So part two I want to talk about the 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 rep the vector space or the representation story or modules. So sometimes I might use these words uh, interchangeably on accident. I should really say the word representation if I think precise. Um, so what we're going to be focusing on is SN representations. SN representations. So just to quickly recall, SN is a symmetric group. Here is a symmetric group. On N letters. So what that means is it's a group of ways to permute N letters is all it is, right? So let me just define some representations for you very quickly. So one person who's going to show up repeatedly is this thing called the permutation module. The permutation module. Who is he? Uh, so if I give you a piece of information, so alpha, 
So here I'm using a different symbol than lambda for just kind of minor reasons. You can pretend this says lambda if you'd like. The only difference is I no longer require that it's not increasing. I just require that the sum of alpha i is equal to n. So I think uh, in terms of combinatorics, a lot of times it's called a composition rather than a partition. So I'm going to define, given an alpha, I'm going to construct this permutation module. It's called, I'm calling it m sub alpha. How is it defined? It's defined as the induction from this parabolic subgroup. So S sub alpha one cross all the way to S sub alpha K up to Sn of of a uh, tensor product of trivial representations. So this is the trivial representation for S alpha one. Last thing is the trivial representation for S alpha K. So um, just to quickly remind you, let me just end the definition here for now. Just to quickly remind you, whenever you have a subalgebra B of A, induction from B to A of a module N is just defined as A tensor over B with N. So the way to kind of think of this is I have a representation of B on M, and I kind of like to make it bigger. Make, make it have a representation structure of A. And the way I do that is I kind of just freely make A act on this while fixing the structure of B acting on it. So that's, that's uh, the construction. So just to kind of make this more concrete, let me do an example quickly. So one way you can think of these permutation representations, well, every time we have a representation, I guess first you want to know what is it as a vector space and what is the action of my group? So let me do an example. M sub, let's do this composition, three comma two comma two. You can think of this as a vector space having basis given by um, uh, vectors which are labeled by these diagrams, okay? So let me just work this way. So fillings of these shapes. So three numbers in the first row, two numbers in the second row, and two numbers in the last row. So the reason I haven't drawn these vertical dividers is because uh, up to reordering in the same row, these things are considered to be the same. So for example, this vector is considered to be the same as this vector. Two, three, one, five, four, six, seven. So these two vectors are considered to be the same. Then there's a lot of other ways to fill in uh, these, these uh, rows with these numbers. So I'm simply dot, dot, dot. And the action of Sn, so in this case, n is uh, 3 plus 2 plus 2 is 7. The action of S7 is just literally you just go in, reach in, and you permute the numbers. You just permute the numbers. So for example, if I act on this vector with the permutation exchange in 1 and 2, I flip these two, it's just still the same vector. So the permutation 1, 2 will leave this vector fixed. But if I, slip, if I swap 1 and 4, I'll get a new vector because now I've swapped across two different rows. OK, so and it's pretty easy to see then that um, it's pretty easy to see then that the dimension, the dimension of this permutation module is going to be equal to just how many ways are there to kind of put seven numbers into these three rows? And the answer is it's a multinomial coefficient, alpha one all the way to alpha k. So the dimension is super easy. The action is also super easy. It's just you reach into this and you permute them. So this is easy. So the takeaway is, so the takeaway is, cram this in here, m alpha is easy. So, so that's the takeaway. Okay, so now that I've talked about these permutation representations or permutation modules, a natural question to ask is if you um, remember from the representation theory of finite groups that CSN is semi simple. So remember that. So recall. CSN is semi-simple. So for this talk, I only care about the ground field being C. I am a, a positive characteristic is too hard. So everything's over C. So this, these are semi-simple. So the first question is, are permutation modules simple? The answer is that they're not in general. OK, so then the next natural question is, how do they break up at simples? And the answer is, um, well, first, let me tell you who the simples are. Definition slash theorem. 
there's this family of modules called SPECT modules. So this is the second family of modules I'm going to tell you about, SPECT modules. They're called, they're called SP or SPECT. I mean, people call these different things. Today I'll call these SP, so like lambda. So they're labeled by lambda. And uh, the, the fact is that they exhaust all symbols. They exhaust all symbols of n for lambda, a partition of n. So the notation for this is this, it's backslash, uh, I forget, yeah, actually, maybe v dash. Okay, so that, that is uh, the classification of simple modules over Sn. Um, and then it's a fact that these permutation modules, so I take m lambda, it breaks up as a direct sum of simple modules. And who are they? Well, there is one copy of the simple module, which is labeled by the same lambda. And then there's some other, other stuff, right? And who are, who are these people? They're sp mu with, you know, maybe some coefficients here. Doesn't matter exactly what. And the mu's that appear have to be greater than lambda in some type of a partial order. So this is called the dominance order. So this is the dominance order on partitions. The way it's defined is you just, um, if, I, if I have two young, young tableaus kind of, or young diagrams like this kind of, this is bigger than this if I just scan from top to bottom and I partially add up the size of all the rows. And if, if every partial sum is bigger than, the, than the, the partial sum here, then this is said to be bigger than this in the dominance order. Uh, that was kind of quick, but the precise details of the dominance order definition is not too important for us. The point is there, there is a dominance order. And under this uh, partial order, this is a structure of the breakdown. So this is kind of an example of what you might call a lowest weight phenomenon. You have a module which is very easy to describe, uh, the, the, i.e. the permutation modules. And you want to ask, how does it break up as simples? And the answer is, um, it has one copy of the same label, and everything else is bigger than that label. So the label is sometimes is, is what we call a weight. And so this is like a, a lowest weight kind of phenomenon going on. OK, uh, and to tie this back to this, the things we were saying about symmetric functions earlier, so why am I saying, why am I talking about these representations is because of this thing called the Frobenius character. Frobenius character. Frobenius character. So this is a map from modules over Sn to uh, symmetric polynomials. So you can imagine symmetric polynomials in n variables, or people people maybe do more often is infinitely many variables, so some kind of like a limit, um, but that doesn't matter too much. So what does this character do? If I give you any module, there's some precise formula. Exactly what that formula is, I'll just quickly write it down, doesn't matter too much exactly what it is. The point is there is a formula, so you take an average over the symmetric group of the trace, of the action of this uh, permutation on your representation, and then you times some power sum, depending on W. I might have gotten a little small towards the end. Okay, but the details don't matter too much. It's just some formula. And what matters is, what does it do to the two types of modules I told you about? It sends permutation modules, M lambda, to H lambda, the complete homogeneous polynomials. And it sends, and this is the second definition you could take, it sends the spec modules, the simple modules, to sure polynomials. Uh, and, the, and the theorem is that chi induces, induces an isomorphism between the growth indie group of mod Sn and symmetric polynomials. So what that means is that, uh, what that means is that, okay, I give you a module, this character will spit out for you a symmetric function. And not only that, the symmetric function tells you, the symmetric polynomial tells you exactly which module it was. So it, it feels like, you know, in this process of taking this character, you should lose a lot of information. But what this theorem, this thing in the bottom is really saying is it's saying that um, you don't lose any information at all. The, the character or the symmetric polynomial tells you exactly which representation you started out with. So that's, that's what the theorem is saying. And so this is one possible definition that you can take. Uh, is you can take the sure function to be defined to be 
the image of the simple modules under this character map, or Venus character map. So then you have to show that these two definitions for the sure polynomial agree. So, you know, this is, maybe you can call it a theorem. Definitions one and two agree. Definitions one and two agree. Okay, so I think I've I've said a lot of stuff, so let me just quickly do some examples. So examples. So this will be an n equals two example. So first let me do, let me take this partition. So there are two partitions of two. You can either break two up as one comma one or two comma or just two. Right? So this is one comma one. So by the definition of the permutation module, I've erased it actually, but it's equal to the induction from S1 cross S1 up to S2 of C, the trivial representation. Well, S1 cross S1 is a trivial group, so there's nothing to see here. Uh, you know, by definition, this will be the group algebra of S2 tensor over the group algebra of the trivial group, which is the C of C. So this is just CS2, right? It's just CS2. So you can think of it as, you know, from this point of view, you can think of it as C with two vectors, which are, you know, one, two, and two, one. And the action is given by swapping the two of them. Or you can think of this as C adjoin two vectors uh, on two vectors, which is one comma S. And you can think this is one, this is S if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so that's this permutation module is two-dimensional. Here's another permutation module. If I take the other partition instead, I'm going to get the induction from S2 to S2. Okay, so that's doing nothing, right? So this is just C. Like I already have the action of S2, it is preordained. So the action of S2 has to be the action of S2. So it's C. Uh, and the action of S on this C is, this was a trivial representation, so X, S acts on this trivially. S acts on this trivially, S is equal to one on this. So since this is one dimensional, it must already be simple. So this is called the trivial module. And this is also the spec module corresponding to this. Comes out. This is the spec module corresponding to that partition. And uh, okay, so of the family that I told you about, there's three of them already here. This the spec and this permutation which coincide. I have one permutation module. So what about the other simple module? Is that permutation module already simple? The answer is no. And the reason is because I can find you a sub-representation inside of it. Namely, if I consider if I consider one plus S as a vector inside of this permutation representation, this permutation module, this is fixed by the action of S2 because S times one plus S is equal to S plus one because S squared is equal to one. So this vector is fixed by S. So it's a sub-representation, it's generally sub-representation. So C with this basis, it's one dimensional space spanned by this vector inside of this gives you a copy of the trivial representation of the of spec uh, sub this. And what about the complement? Well, the complement is one minus s. Notice one minus s, when you act on it with s, you get s minus s squared, which is s minus one. So you get minus one minus s. So this vector generates a subspace, which is acted on by s by a sign. So this generates, so this generates a, uh, generates uh, uh, what's called a sign representation inside of, inside of this permutator module. And this is what's called, and this is the spec module corresponding to the column. This is the column. And this, will pers this, this behavior persists in general. Whenever you have a spec module labeled by row, this is called, the this is the trivial representation. And a spec module labeled by column is a sign representation. There's always a trivial and a sign representation of any SN. Okay, so what's the takeaway? Maybe there isn't much of a takeaway. Let me just uh, not get at least. Let me just write this down. Okay, so that's telling us that M, this permutation module breaks up as a direct sum of simple modules like this. It breaks up like this. Okay. Okay. Uh, now let me do a character computation very quickly. 
So the shear function, the shear polynomial corresponding to the column, but we should be adding g. You can write this as a determinant. Determinant h. So h1, 1, h2, and h0 is going to 1. So this is h1 squared minus h2. Now h1 squared is a character of this module, and h2 is a character of the uh, of this permutation module by this fact over here. By this fact over here. So what this is saying is the character of the spec module is equal to the character of m this minus this. So again, this is kind of an alternating sum thing. This is the same thing I just recasted this. Alternating sum is an alternating sum of characters. So then you might ask, can I somehow recover this formula as an alternating sum of characters of a resolution? So is there some somehow a way to do this? Um, so can I interpret this as somehow, you know, I'm, I'm taking this representation M, I'm carving out a subset here, a, a sub-representation here, and then what I have left is this. And the answer is, of course, yes, and this is a direct sum. So this exact sequence splits, so this question is kind of stupid. But the reason I'm asking this question is in part motivated by the, the part three that I'm going to tell you about, and also because when you try to do this story for higher rank, it becomes more difficult very quickly. So for here, for rank one, it's obvious what to do. Everything breaks up in a super obvious way. But as you get into higher rank, it becomes more difficult to figure out exactly which permutation modules you should be carving out of the big permutation module and how you should be doing this. So this is our dream. So, um, so is there some way to make precise? So, so some precise way in which I have you no know, this permutation module M column, and inside of it maybe I have a submodule M corresponding to the row, such that the spec module is no longer a direct sum N. It is a quotient but not a sub. And so this thing would be a sub, but not a quotient. Is there some way to witness some type of a non-semi-simple phenomenon going on, which would make it easier for you to guess what's going on? So, so just to reiterate, the philosophy here is kind of that things are semi-simple, so there's too many things you can try. If things were non-semi-simple, if this was only a sub-module, not a quotient, there's only one thing you can do. You can't swap these two places. So that's what we're going to try to witness. And before I witness that for you, let me just quickly say something from uh, uh, the historical context. Well, the historical context is coming from Lee theory. Uh, this is a common rhetoric seminar, so I won't say too much here. Let me just quickly tell you like the brief overview of, of category O. So category O, what is it? It's, uh, this is a category of specially, of, of specially chosen, specially chosen modules, which I'll just denote mod, mods, over, in general, any complex semi-simple Lie algebra, but maybe let me just take SLN for concreteness, SLN, okay? Lie algebra of traceless matrices. Um, this category has five, so for fans of Godfather, uh, there's the five big families of modules here. So, so five families, families of modules. So they're all labeled by some lambda here. So here lambda is going to be like some type of a weight, but you can imagine, uh, you can imagine there are partitions. So delta lambda, L lambda, nabla lambda, and last Q lambda. So what they are is the P's are the projective decomposables on certain perspectives. The deltas are what's called vermas or standard modules. The L's are the simple modules. That's simple in like the same sense as usual. Uh, these nablas are what's called covermas or dual vermas. And the Q's are injective decomposables or straight injectives. That kind of got a little bad towards the end. And I said dual verma, so there's some type of a duality theory. So there's some duality theory exchanging these. So maybe you can focus on just the first three up to duality. Okay, what's the point? The point is that the verma modules are easy in some sense. 
they're easy to describe. You can kind of think of them as waterfalls uh, without going into details. It's like, it's like kind of like you start at a weight and just kind of freely go downwards. Um, and the simple modules are harder, are a little harder to describe. So one natural question is to, is to ask, okay, how can I describe the things that are harder to describe in terms of the things that are easy to describe? First, the first thing you might try is maybe, maybe the verm is also like the permutation modules break up as a direct sum of symbols. And the answer is they don't. Category O is highly non semi symbol. Uh, so instead, what you're going to have is you're going to have a, um, a Jordan Hurler filtration. So you're going to have a finite filtration of modules. So delta, in general, delta lambdas would maybe have you know, a, a, a filtration of some modules, uh, you know, n to sub n, zero or something. And then each quotient at each step, so this quotient, the first quotient is going to be the simple with the same label, just like here, I'd erase it, I'd erase it, unfortunately. Just like how the permutation module, uh, the first sum and is a symbol of the same label. So here the first quotient is this of the same label. And then the other ones, the other quotients that show up will be L mu for mu less than lambda. So earlier it was mu bigger than lambda. So this is kind of flipped. This is a highest weight theory, uh, but the details don't matter too much. So, okay, so you have a non semi simple thing going on, but there's also this type of uh, like a, you only go down in your poset. And there's an upgraded version of this. So this is called the region of the resolution. EGG resolution. Turns out there's a resolution where you start with, so if, if L lambda is a finite dimensional symbol, if you start with this normal module, turns out I can find some direct sum of some other smaller normal module and I'll just label these as question mark because the details of the labels don't matter too much, such that the quotient is exactly the simple. And again, in, just like in PIE, there's some overkill here. So you have to map some other normal modules into it and et cetera, and it keeps going. And it turned out it's a finite resolution. Eventually you're done. So this is, Here, BGG resolution. So you can kind of think of this as you know, delta lambda. This is delta lambda. I cut out two waterfalls inside of it. And now there's some overlap. There's some overkill, so I have to, I have to kind of patch it up with another smaller waterfall. So that's kind of that, the abstract picture. OK, and just as a remark, so this also, this resolution also casts something as a shadow. If you take the alternating sum of what's called the character, there's, there's a notion of character in the theory. Uh, this categorifies, so this categorifies, categorifies uh, the wild character formula. Wild character formula. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about that too much. No. Okay, so the reason I'm bringing this up is that this question, oh, sorry, this question about uh, finding a a, uh, a resolution. Like, a, like the exact sequence I wrote down earlier in the n equals two case has been done before. So historically what people have done, so this is in work by, for example, Akin, Delavinsky, Orlana Ram, and uh, Arakawa Suzuki. Historically what people do is they construct a functor. So they take category O and they give you a functor to the mod category of modules over SN. They show that this functor is exact and they just take the BGG resolution here and since f is exactly just hit the BGG resolution with this functor, and you'll get another resolution in the in the land of SN representations. Okay, but um, and then they also show that uh, the, the standard the Verma modules are going to be mapped to the permutation modules, and then the simple modules get mapped to the spec modules. Okay, then you get for free, or not for free. You have to prove you know f is exact and it does this, but then you get for free that you have a resolution of the spec modules by these m's, right? So you just take this and you replace L with the spec, replace the deltas with m's. So you get it. Okay, so then why am I trying to do this at all? The answer is because uh, O is highly non semi simple, whereas modules over S and is semi simple. So in the process of hitting this BGG resolution with this functor F, you're losing a lot of information. So the goal is to kind of uh, come up with this resolution natively in the land of modules over SN. Okay, but modules over SN is semi-simple, so how are you going to do this? And so now I can precisely state the goal of this project. So 
the goal is to find So I want to find an algebra A that emits some map from CSN. So maybe as a subalgebra or maybe something else, such that this A has some families of modules. I'm going to call them delta lambda and L lambda in an abusive notation. What do this, these mean? Uh, so this delta is going to be some type of a standard, some type of a standard module, and the L's are going to be the simple modules, such that such that there is a VGP resolution, such that I have a resolution, L lambda, and then the first term is going to be a delta lambda, and the later terms are going to be some other direct socks, question marks over here. And from the Jacobi Trudy determinant formula, you can know what these direct sums will be. These will be direct sums over permutations of certain lengths. But for now, I'm just going to leave them as this, and this is to be finite. A finite resolution. So this is a resolution as A module. So I'm going to write over A. I want an algebra A with families of modules delta and L such that I have this BGG resolution and such that when I apply the restriction functor along this map from CSN, when I restrict this resolution that over SN, I will recover exactly SP lambda to permutation module over lambda and then you know, the epsilon and then question mark, question mark. And then when I take when I take alternating sum of Frobenius character, so uh, I'm just going to call this Euler character, the Euler Frobenius character, you get exactly the Jacobi Trudy alternating sum. You get that sure function S lambda is going to be equal to, so plus some product of H's, right? Because character of a permutation module is some product of H's, and then minus some, minus some sum of products of H's, and then plus some sum of product of H's, and then et cetera, et cetera. So that is the goal. That is the goal of this project, to come up with this algebra A. OK, so you know that's like finding a needle in a haystack. How do you come up with an algebra A like this? And that brings me to part four. So in general, this is going to be done by taking a what's called like a quotient by no potent cells of a cyclotomic KLR algebra. But I don't think I have enough time to define the KLR algebra in this talk. So I will give you kind of the most um, a basic example in rank one for which it is easiest to see the relationship to S2. So the K, the rhythm, the relationship between Sn and KLR in general is kind of it's very explicit, but it's kind of complicated. The formulas are kind of big. So so I'm just gonna do the easiest case and tell you about the degenerate affine Hecke algebra. In the rank one. This is kind of where this project started. Okay, so this algebra is called h hat underscore two. Um, it's generated by elements. So kind of in my area, we like to think of uh, these things diagrammatically. So I'm going to think of an element of this algebra as a maybe linear combination of, but diagrams. So diagrams. So elements, what are these diagrams? I'm going to think of them as two straight lines, maybe a crossing, or maybe two straight lines with a dot on top, or maybe a, a dot on the left, or maybe two straight lines with a dot on the right. So what this means is in terms of algebraic symbols, you would think this as element one, the unit, you would think of this as S, the crossing, right? So you're taking, think about the transposition, you're taking two elements and you're transposing them. So this is corresponding to S. This is something which I'm gonna call X1, and this is something called, I'm gonna call X2. Just kind of two extra polynomial variables. Okay, so it's generated by these elements. So what's the rule for multiplication? Diagrammatically, multiplication just means I stack this on top of this. So for example, S times X1 is equal to, I stack this diagram on top of this diagram. It's like this, so like this. Okay, so this multiplication must be subject to some rules. So let me just say what the rules are. Rules. First rule is that one and S generate a copy of S2, the symmetric group. So what that says is that S squared must be one. So S squared is equal to one. So the crossing of the lines. Um, the second rule is kind of the, the most important rule in some sense. It's telling you how the dot and the crossing interact with each other. 
So the mnemonic that I like to say is uh, like, I always have to say this whenever I do a computation to remind myself is it's right minus left equals straights. So right minus left equals straights. It's also equal to right minus left. So you can pass a dot across the crossing at the cost of incurring this error term. So you can think of this as a commutation bracket relation in like a SL2 or something. That's a bit of a stretch maybe. And then the third thing is that uh, these two things, a C adjoining X1 comma X2 is a commutative subalgebra. Okay, so that's just saying these two dots, you know, like uh, x1, x2 is equal to x2, x1, okay? So note, so right, so let me just, worth writing this out, note that cs2 sits inside of h2 hat, just by mapping one to one s test. So this embedding is very obvious. So then, to, to let me show you this non-semi-simple phenomenon, let, and this notation is provocatively chosen, delta sub this column be defined as I induce from C adjoin x1 comma x2. So this community of subalgebra, which morally you should really think of as, even though I haven't defined it, h hat one cross h hat one. You should think of this as a parabolic thing. And you induce all the way up to h hat two. What are you, what are you inducing? You're inducing the action on the one dimensional module on which x1 acts by delta and x2 acts by delta minus one. So, if you'd like, you can pretend delta is equal to two. So delta is some number here. Pretend delta is equal to two. Uh, and if you're kind of familiar with the representation theory of Sn, what this delta and delta minus one relationship is coming from is it's coming from the relationship between the contents of the first box and the second box in the in the in the in the, in the, in the partition. Okay. So as a vector space, you know. It's easy to see this is equal to, this is a two dimensional space and it's generated by, well, you know, the induction is this tensor, this over this. So one tensor one, S tensor one. For short, I'll just call these one and S. But remember that you, can, you should really maybe be thinking of this as one tensor one, S tensor one. Okay. Uh, so claim one plus S is still generating, still generates a sub rep. Obviously, it generates, obviously, it's fixed by the action of S. So we have to check under X1 and X2 what happens. So this is a computation you have to check. So X1, let me just do one of these three very quickly. X times 1 plus S, so that's equal to X1 plus X1 times S. So I'm going to write this diagrammatically to kind of show you uh, what computations kind of look like. For so 1 with X, and then S with X1 on top, like this. So now I have to remember that the left, uh, when you're writing things out algebraically using symbols, the left corresponds to the top of this diagram. So in this thing, this is like some lean tensor C, right? So C is on the right, so C is, imagine C is on the bottom here. So when I drop the dot to the bottom of the diagram, when the dot hits the bottom, it becomes either delta or delta minus one, depending on which dot it is, x1 or x2. So I can kind of just drop this dot to the bottom by isotopy. So the first dot acts by delta. So this is delta times this. What about this one? Well, to get this dot to go to the bottom, I have to permute it across, uh, I have to commute it across this crossing. So I have to say this is this minus this. That's the, the commutation rule up there. And now I have an X2 on the bottom line. So that's gonna be, well, let me first combine like terms. So I have a term here and a term here, combine like terms. This is delta minus one times the straight lines, plus, and then the second dot X by delta minus one. So you can see very conveniently that I can combine like terms, and this is equal to delta minus one times one plus s. So one plus s. You want to write this directly. So one plus s is fixed by x one, well with like some value. And the similar computation will show you the same thing is true for x two. But uh, this is not a direct sum end. I 
kind of see this like uh, earlier, one minus s was a direct sum n. If you, in this computation, if you replace this plus with a minus, you'll see if I just take this plus, replace it with a minus here, this minus becomes a plus then. But this one is still a minus because this delta minus one is coming from the action of the second dot. So it can no longer combine like terms. So one minus s is no longer kept in the same one dimensional subspace by x1. So one plus s is going to be a sum module, but not a quotient. And the quotient by the sub subspace is going to be a quotient, but not a sum module. So here you can see some type of a non semi simple phenomenon. So I've kind of run out of space over there, so I'll just draw this picture here instead. So that's an example of where you can see this phenomenon where, uh, let me just draw like this, where you really do have this module you started with. You have a sum module, which is spanned by one plus s. And whatever is left over is not a, is not a sum module anymore. It's not a sum module. Instead, it's only a quotient. So this is the leftover turns out it's going to be the sign, sign module. Okay, so let's just kind of, um, so the philosophy here is you expand the algebra a little bit. So you include these dots here somehow, and that is enough for you to witness this non semi simple phenomenon. And now let me say, so now let me just kind of speed run a little bit through through the, the proof and, and the construction. So in general, what's gonna happen is you're gonna start with the, with your lambda that you wanna categorify, and then you're gonna construct some type of a, um, you're gonna come up with some parameters alpha and omega, and you're gonna construct what's called a cyclotomic KLR algebra. I'm not gonna define this, but just to kind of put it on the board, cyclotomic KLR algebra. It turns out that these are somehow, somehow isomorphic to what's called cyclotomic degenerate affine Heck algebras. And then you take a further quotient by what's called nilpotent cells, and you're gonna get this algebra of this. And this is my algebra A. This is the A I was referring to earlier. Details of the construction don't matter too much, um, but I do, what I do want to say is, since this is a combinatorial seminar, I want to say a little bit about how some combinatorial facts play a key role in the proof. So first of these I'm going to talk about is the Mobius function. So this is another example of, a, of, a, of an alternating sum, which you can kind of lift to a statement about vector spaces, in this case, cohomology. So kind of 5.1. So in general, just briefly recap, some Mobius theory. Anytime you have a post set, you can construct what's called a Mobius function. And this is defined recursively by setting if you have two elements. So this Mobius function takes in two elements of the post set and it outputs either one if x is equal to y, or you can inductively define that as negative sum of x, so sum over z of mu x comma z if x is less than y, or zero if else, right, if up that else. What is the point of this function that you construct this way? Well, it's, it's two properties, most famous of which is Mobius inversion. If you have g of y, if you have two functions of g and f on your post set such that g of y is equal to the sum over this of f of x, then you can actually, in some sense, invert this equation. You can figure out what f is in terms of g. So PIE is actually a special case of this. And another property is it's like multiplicative inverse, like, like mu is multiplicative inverse, is inverse under convolution to like some, some type of a, some type of an indicator function on whether or, on, whether or not an interval is uh, not empty, not too important. The point is there is this thing called a Mobius function and uh, it's uh, I think it, on, on the Wikipedia page, you want to find about it. You want to find out about it under the page on incidence algebras. Um, the point is, there's a theorem by Philip Hall. This is the Philip Hall theorem. I don't know if this is like two last names or if Philip was his first name. The theorem says that this Mobius function is also equal to the sum is also an alternating sum i greater than or equal to zero of negative one to the i times the number of chains of length i 
between between x and y. So what that means is it's a chain of less than signs, starts at x, ends at y, and there are i less than symbols in between. So for example, uh, so for example, the chain x less than y is a chain of of length one. That's okay. So that's that's an alternating sum formula. And uh, and in this proof, what's going to happen is you're going to turn this alternating sum formula into a statement about cohomology. So this is going to be, so um, this is going to somehow be the dimension of an X group. And this is going to be an alternating sum of some bar complex. So number of chains of length I is somehow going to end up being some type of a dimension of an augmentation ideal tensor itself I times. I'll say a little bit more about this later. But first, let me tell you about a, a graph, the Bruhat graph. So fact, Sn has a structure of a poset. This is called the Bruhat order on Sn. The way it's defined, just very briefly, is to say that two permutations, u is less than w if some substring, if some substring, not necessarily consecutive, of some or or equivalently every um, reduced expression for at, for w so red x I'll explain what this is briefly red x of w is a red x of u so what red x means is just a way to a, a minimal length way to write w in terms of simple transpositions so for example let me just briefly give you an example of S3. This is, I think, probably the, the smallest or the large, largest reasonable example. Both, actually. Uh, so example S3. So the longest length permutation in S3 is a thing that exchanges one and three and leaves two fixed. So you can write that. So, you know, one goes to three, three goes to one, and two gets fixed. You can write this as a composition of simple transpositions as S1, S2, S1 or equivalently S2, S1, S2. And the Bruhat graph is going to be, so this is the longest thing, S1, S2, S1. So here I've been using the word longest, and from this graph, it'll be kind of clear what that means. So S1, S2 is a substring here. S2, S1 is also a substring here. So I draw this, I draw this line here, meaning that they're comparable. S1 is a substring here, S1 is a substring here, S2 is a substring here, S3 is a substring here, etc. So this is the Bruhat graph of S3. Uh, and there's a function, there's, there's a notion of length as well. It just means that the length of W is equal to the number of simple transpositions, number of SIs in the minimal, in, in the red X, in the minimal length expression for, for W. Okay. So, It's a theorem. I forget who proved it. Maybe it was Janssen or, or somebody else. Um, it's a theorem that, so the Sn is certainly a poset and you can certainly try to construct a Mobius function for it. It turns out mu, so for the poset Sn, for the Bruhat poset, mu between two permutations is equal to negative one to the length of W minus the length of U. Okay, so then if I combine this formula with this formula here, this is saying that the Mobius function, which is negative one to some power, so negative one to some power is equal to some alternating sum. So I have, let me, instead of writing neg like negative one to this, let me just write plus or minus one for now. So plus or minus one is equal to some alternating sum. So negative one to the i times the number of chains, number of length i chains. For short, let me just write this. So this is an alternating sum. And the point of this proof is that, that's, um, is that you're going to realize this one as a dimension of some type of a cohomology. Dimension of a cohomology. So if you're more familiar with the theory, this you should think of this as the, as the uh, Costant theorem of the algebra cohomology. And over here, you have, um, and over here, you're going to have somehow some dimension of some, some 
far complex augmentation ideal tensor I, I times. Okay, and then so this dimension cohomology is somehow gonna, the dimension, the fact that this dimension of this cohomology is one is gonna somehow correspond to the fact that the multiplicity multiplicity inside BGG, inside that BGG resolution is always one. It's always one. So each permutation appears exactly once in the determinant, which is just a standard factor linear algebra, but this is somehow corresponding to that. Uh, and I've kind of run out of time to say the second combinatorial fact, I guess, at this point. So maybe let me just stop here. Thank you. Very nice talk. Any questions for our speaker? And also, okay, somebody. Oh, thanks. Yep. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> Anyone online has any questions for our speaker? Yes. Uh, here, I just what the dimensions of the permutation modules and start modules are. Yes. Uh, so just a. Uh, Right, so taking alternating sum of Frobenius characters like a, is a big operation. A, a simpler thing you can do is just take the alternating sum of dimensions, just literal dimensions as like vector spaces. And the dimension of the dimension of this permutation module was some type of a multinomial coefficient. So if you like, you can re replace alpha with lambda. And the dimension of the spec modules is something a little more complicated. It's like called like the hook length formula. To be honest, I'm not sure I can reproduce it off the top of my head. Uh, I think what it is is equal to n factorial divided by like the product of some like of some hook lengths. And what hook length means is just I think you just take a. It's a very combinatorial formula. Like you start out with lambda. I hope I'm getting this right. And you product over all the different boxes inside of your partition, and you look at the length of that hook. So for example, what hook means is you start from the right and you go to the bottom, so like this. So this is a three hook, a length three hook. And you take the product over all of this, divide n factorial by that, and that's going to be the dimension of your spec module. Yeah. So, so this expression is, if you take this resolution and then you hit it with uh, alternate sums of dimensions instead, it tells you about this multinomial coefficient. This is like this alternating sum of or the other way around. This is also oh, so that guy's yeah. yeah. Is, is, is that like a known conical effect, for example? Or uh, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's known. I think all all sorts of facts about dimensions of, of, of like uh, symmetric groups are almost definitely known already. Like these things have been studied to death. Yeah. But this is like a neat way to recover it, certainly. Any other questions? All right, if not, then that's, that's the speaker again. Thank you. Very nice. All right, thank you for everyone online joining this. I will post the recording on YouTube. See you. Have a nice weekend, everyone.